Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there are still some seats up the front here if everyone wants to, if anyone wants to come up a bit further. No one ever moves when I say that. Welcome to Bridge, uh, Brickworks in Richmond, the Design Centre. Today will be the last of the International Speaker Series for 2017. My name is Matt Hale and I'm one half of the business development team here in Victoria. Unfortunately, Nick Vex and the other half is, uh, is taken ill and won't be with us this evening. In regards to housekeeping, if you can please put your phones on silent. Our uh, bathroom's located just here to my left, uh, behind the wooden panelling and to the right, through the doors and down the hallway. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Sandra Barclay and Stephen Vaudry for taking the time to present here this evening. It's a privilege to have you here in Melbourne this afternoon. Sorry, Baraday. My apologies. <laughs> I'd also like to thank all of you for being here and for your ongoing support for Brickworks, our events and products. We look forward to continuing this in 2018 with 50 national events scheduled. One of which uh, of these events is the Venice Biennale, which will be held in May, and they'd like to show a brief video. We hope to see you all there. Again, thank you and enjoy your evening. Thank you, Matt, and thank you to Brickworks for their wonderful ongoing support of this International Speaker Series. Um, I've had the wonderful pleasure of spending the last eight days with Sandra Barclay, and I'll just say a few words that, first of all, she's a wonderful person, really, really calm, cool and collected, friendly, easy to talk to. But she's a fantastic architect, and I don't think you're going to be disappointed by what you see tonight. So. I hope you sit back and enjoy what we have. And please don't leave too early because we have a lucky door prize. Sandra has been very kind to bring a copy of uh, a monograph of Barclay and Krauss's work for each of the design studios, so six prizes. So we'll be handing this out as a prize at the end of the evening. Good evening everyone and welcome to the third and final International Speaker Series for 2017. And for the first time ever, we're live streaming tonight. So if we do have an audience, since the connections were moved, um, hello to our audience in the live stream world. I'm Stephen Varity, for those that don't know, a Sydney-based architect, educator, writer and critic. And I am the curator and organiser and moderator of the Brickworks International Speaker Series. Tonight we have Sandra Barclay, a fantastic architect all the way from Peru, as our latest international speaker. Sandra will present for about an hour, after which I will sit and have a conversation with her for about half an hour in front of you. After that, you will be able to come and have a chat to her. So please take advantage of that opportunity and come and have some one-on-one -on -one time. That's part of the reason we do this, that you have an international speaker in your midst 
that you can gain some further insight and knowledge from. At this point, I would ask all of you to switch off your phones, please, if you haven't already done so. When I select architects for this series, I try to find people creating engaging, meaningful and stimulating work and perhaps finding people who many of you may not have heard of yet. Sandra Barclay is one such architect, producing a powerful and beautiful body of work, like the project in this image behind me, this one being a framed view within a framed view. Sandra Barclay studied architecture both in Peru and France and received a master's degree in landscape and territory at the Diego Portales University, Chile. Sandra established Barclay and Krauss architecture in Paris in 1994 with Jean-Pierre Krauss. And in 2006, they opened an office in Lima, Peru, where they are now based. The work of Barclay and Krauss architecture has received the Latin America Prize in 2013, the Peruvian National Prize of Architecture in 2014, and the Oscar Niemeyer Prize in 2016. Sandra currently teaches at the Pontificia Universidad Católica del Peru, having previously taught at the Paris La Villette School of Architecture in 2006. She was also a recipient of the Fulbright Foundation and the French Academy de Architecture Fellowship in 2000. And finally, just last year in 2016, Sandra and Jean-Pierre were curators of the proposal Our Amazon Frontline for the Peruvian Pavilion at the 15th Venice Biennale, which received the special mention of the Biennale jury. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sandra Barclay. Good evening, everybody. I am very pleased to be here in Melbourne. And uh, I want also to thank uh, Brickworks for the invitation. It has been a wonderful trip. Six cities in, in 10 days here in Australia. <laughs> so I'll show you how we do architecture on the other side of the Pacific Ocean through the design process of four projects in different parts of the Peruvian coast. In every project we do, our first effort is to find the good questions that will guide our process. Not with the intention of finding the answers, but with the aim to make us think about the means we have to engage and the meaning that our buildings will convey. The simple pleasures of this house in a shanty town in Lima has a lot to show us. It has been built with what is available, but matches perfectly with the needs a Limian citizen needs in our mild climate. A bed sheet to protect us from the sunshine, a good table to eat wonderful Peruvian food, a view of the landscape, and a wooden hut to protect the intimate spaces. Sometimes, working with what is available help us to formulate the correct questions before designing. The economy of resource is extremely useful if we manage to see limitations as opportunities. It's more about a shift of gaze than the amount of means or the availability of materials that we have to build architecture. As the renowned Peruvian chefs did, we have to find which are our ingredients as architects. These are ours, culture, territory, climate, place, program, and technology. They are not new, but working in a conscious way with what is available can guide us about how to combine them. The uncertainty and the scarcity of means usual in the Global South, take us to favor the strategy as the origin for the design instead of a more traditional approach 
based in the order, composition, and language of the architectonic object. The strategy defines the way in which we must combine these ingredients. Their combination acts over the essential elements in architecture, space, light, matter, and time. Culture, our first ingredient, is also one of the most important ones. Our long stay in Europe as young architects and the patient search through drawing revealed us a lot of clues in order to build up our references and gave us the necessary distance to see our country in quite a different way. A constant and resolute work is part of this patient search. In each project we go from the sketches to the model, then to the precise drawing, into the reality, and then back to, again to sketches, model, and draw drawings. It's a circular dynamic between mind, hand, and matter. In Peru, our ingredient of culture comes with a wonderful past. We are interested in studying this fantastic legacy from the design strategies set in place to build in the landscape and not simply as an historical landmark nor an archaeological beauty. We admire the ancient Peruvians for their knowledge to use what is available in order to give sensitive response to solve human needs, construct, constructing the landscape and understanding the territory within their own logics. Since Jean-Pierre and myself came back to Peru 11 years ago, after almost 16 years living and working in Europe, we are increasingly asking ourselves if territory, landscape, architecture, space, and matter can still be seen as interdependent and with the same value. We've been asking ourselves if, if this approach to building can be useful in the ways we imagine architecture nowadays. We have to introduce our second ingredient, territory term which in Latin language has a slightly different meaning than in English, referring to a physical and geographical condition more than an administrative one. This is where Lima is, quite at the same latitude as Darwin. Huge differences start when we put color to this planisphere. With color, we realize that the Peruvian coast harbors the coldest tropical seawater temperatures at such close latitude to the equator. The cold current coming up from the Antarctic makes our tropic very different from the white sandy beaches with coconut trees. We live in an extremely arid desert, a totally barren landscape and yet a very humid one. Our coast is a misty desert with no shadows and no contrast because of the lack of sunshine many months in a year. And to understand the Peruvian territory is more useful a section than a map. In Lima, we have almost a permanent cloud, no precipitation, and mild temperatures. And these con particular conditions generate a very benign climate, our third ingredient that represents an immense opportunity for architecture, disposing it from creating shelter and allowing it to concentrate in the creation of intimacy and wellness. The clue to inhabit this desert is the water flowing from the Andes glaciers to the ocean, in short and tiny rivers that create true oases along all the Peruvian coast. Again, we have to draw this time a schematic map. We find a regular pattern in all the coast, a sequence of Andes headlands and transversal oases about 18 to 25 miles away from each other. These valleys are linked by the Pan American Highway and Lima is located in between three of them. If we jump into a different scale and focus on them, we find a fractal landscape where ravines replace the valleys and cliffs 
replace the Andes headlands. The 18 miles span reduces to 100 feet. And it's here on that edge that we had the opportunity to build the first project I'm going to show you, the place for remembrance. The Commission for Truth and Reconciliation, in charge of taking to public account the facts and responsibilities occurred during 20 years of political violence that caused more than 70,000 deaths, had the aspiration to build a place for reconciliation for Peruvian, of Peruvian people. A national architectural competition was launched for the creation of a cultural center that would articulate the efforts to show to the future generations the memory of those years. In order to prevent repeating the errors of the past. The place is our fourth main ingredient. We try to understand this one digging in its memory. The site for the place of remembrance was a residual area left by the destruction of one of these successions of cliffs and ravines when the roadway to the beaches was created. We decided to embed the building with the logic of the cliffs with a compact structure. Architecture would be related to memory not only by its programmatic content, but by revealing the memory of Lima's landscape. The artificial cliff and the new ravine that is therefore created take us to a territorial logic which physically extends itself throughout the Bay of Lima and eventually relates with the fractal territory. The section helps us again to understand that the territorial logic meets the economic logic. By inserting the compact building near the cliff, we had fewer and shorter foundation piles, which m were a major issue in keeping the building inside the budget. Territory, memory, and budget as reasons for putting the building in its correct place help us explore the environmental choices that could make further savings. Thanks to our mild climate, a good orientation, the use of the cliff as a sun shield, and creating one single space inside the building, we managed to avoid the use of air conditioning. The other important thing here, water, was used carefully by recycling grey water for watering plants and for firefighting reservoir. The building stands at the edge of this territorial sequence as the last of the cliffs. The site is surrounded by the vehicular descent to the beaches and there is a narrow passage between the main urban avenue with public transportation and the site. We decided to transform this major problem into a design opportunity. The narrow pathway allows us to distance ourselves from the city, to leave daily preoccupations behind, and to get ready for an exhibit which is not easy to assimilate. At the bottom of this newly created ravine, there is a marked physical consciousness, a kind of intensified presence. We are no more in a urban setting, nor in a natural landscape. The act of descending into this crevice turns gravity into a very explicit force. This tour unfolds in the interior, creating an open circuit of plazas and ramps, ascending to light where the non-programmatic spaces are predominant. While technology evolves, evolves faster and faster, space endures. 
Everything we see here is in the order of permanent. The only change is providing by the sun path during the day. When a structure defines what is permanent, it allows us to configure not only the interior space, but also the transition space between interior and exterior, which captures light and brings it to, in to the interior. As in this house at the south of Lima, where the main structure is what defines the transitional spaces, and at the same time defines the interior space. Space is what is permanent, what prevails in time. The research center and the different exhibition spaces in the place of remembrance are accessible through a series of ramp, a magnificent device which we architects have in order to slow down the, our urban frenzy time. We climb smoothly, taking time, guided by natural light, so we can rise our gaze and move through the space. The railings and the technical columns that contain the electric and security system are the non-permanent elements. These are painted in white, while the permanent is defined by the exposed concrete structure. This is the finished building. Then comes the content, which brings the purpose of the building. And then it becomes alive as I'm going to show you in this video.
This building taught us that in non-industrial countries, the building's strength must not lay in the finishing nor in a well-executed building. We discovered that craftsmanship, still alive in common workers, is one of the most valued assets we have. The choice of pouring concrete manually allowed us to reproduce the matter found in the cliff's alluvial strata, merging with its mass and hue. Making use of artisanal formwork assembled by hand using the old wooden planks introduce indetermination. Indetermination that absorb all the true imperfections or defects which are produced by inevitable human error. Imperfection was kept as a trace in the construction process. The plants that are meant to set a future action lose their supremacy, su supremacy as the building started to draw a map that described the construction process. And this is the guardian dog looking at you. The same happened with other materials, like for example the cobblestones, obtained in place and arranged by hand in which workers could freely express their skills. In this building devoted to memory, the irregular walls, the cobblestone pavement and the traces of handcrafting are the evidence of human labor. They become part of the memory of the building process and the building starts to look as a map of human intervention. At left, we can see the footprints of the guardian dog you just saw, that we insisted to keep them in the stamped cement floor of the ramp. And at the right, the handprints are those of the people who literally built this place. Let's go back to the territorial scale to show you the next project, located this time in the desert between two river oases. These summer houses are located in a barren landscape defined by a series of coves which outline the way the Andes reach the sea, a series of 100 foot height cliffs that separate the vast extension of sand dunes from the huge Pacific Ocean. Again, we found the right thing to do was to turn back our gaze to culture. The pre-Columbian strategies for downscaling the vastness of this territory into living spaces by creating platforms and defining an enclosure could be foundational of our project. These two basic elements could define the new ground for life and provide the needed intimacy in the vast desert. We were fascinating searching like archaeologists for design strategies that are still valid nowadays. We create a platform in the slope, the enclosure, a pool railing that bring, the, the, that bring the ocean closer to the platform, an element to give us shade, and we frame the landscape. Underneath the platform, we excavate the spaces that need more intimacy. And the pool act as a brisole and protect them from the setting sun. Our aspiration was to get rid of conventions and imagine houses that take advantage of our mild climate for creating a microcosmic space for life in this absolutely abstract landscape. One of the first houses we did in this location was the Equis house, while we were still living in France. It was a keystone for our further works and was a big magnet to keep working in Peruvian projects. Using the minimum available elements, we turned livable this abstract landscape. In time, we were asked to design some other houses in the same location. They were a design laboratory in which we learned from one to another on how to relate to this landscape. 
instead of making pretty objects isolated in the landscape, we opted to create a microcosmos of the landscape in each house. We understand the landscape from the house, while from the beach, the houses seem to be an extrusion of the cliff, and from the desert, they seem to be exca excavated on the sand. The silent enclosure hides and protects the inhabited microcosmos from the vastness of the desert. The enclosure leads us to, confine, to a confined open space which unfolds into an outer larger one pointing to the ocean. If we consider that if the biggest asset is weather itself, architecture in this place is freed from one of its major reasons for existence, to provide shelter. Without the need for shelter, the creation of intimacy, beauty and quality of life is central to architecture. The platform is transformed in an artificial beach. As the pools are a mandatory feature in a holiday house, we proposed them as ludic spaces where, where neighbors can relate between each other. Underneath, they act as a protection for the bedrooms. Each house has an open, stair, open stairs to connect the artificial beach to the intimate spaces. Underneath, the excavated volumes suddenly expand using the glass as a reflecting and transparent matter, and not only as an industrialized construction material. Is in a situation like that and doing houses in different, in different times al that allowed us to discover this red pusillanic cement used only in, this, in the retaining walls normally buried. We use this cement in following projects at this house in the north coast of, of Lima, where the red structure contains a series of bolts defining the social spaces, and also the main loggia, the main bedroom loggia. Culture and technology, our sixth ingredient, can work together. Local craft traditions gives, gives us clues about forgotten or undervalued materials. In this case, a bench and a shade made of reed are the essential elements from a traditional house in the coast that are still perfect for a contemporary house. And to adapt industrial materials like glass to a surface which has been modeled by hand, the simplest gesture becomes the most appropriate like this cutting concrete for fitting a sliding dough in a non-so-vertical wall. Again, the plans that are meant to guide the construction suddenly give place to the map that the building itself is drawing about the memory of its construction and the people who participated in it. And um, again, let's see how life gets into this place.
We recently completed this third project, this time in a city at the crossroad between the Pan American, uh, Pan -American Highway and the river. This is Piura, a booming city in the north of Peru, near the equator. The local university needed more space for a new student population and decided to build generic classrooms and faculty offices. Their aspiration to improving teaching and infrastructure gave us the opportunity to go beyond the standard response to this need. The campus is in fact a huge dry forest of mesquite, a usual landscape of the north which has a hot climate and being under the influence of El Nino current, suffering heavy rain, rains every 10 years. Local people used to walk from one tree to another following shade and avoiding the hot sand. Our first question this time was about climate, landscape and education. How should be a place for learning here? Reading Louis, Louis Kahn was a good hint if we wanted to go back to the roots of the question. He said, schools began with a man under a tree who did not know he was a teacher, sharing his realization with a few others who did not, who did not know they were students. The dry forest helped us translate this very easily into architecture. So instead of imagining a building, we proposed a shaded space capable of creating good conditions for learning inside and outside from classrooms. Where the buildings themselves are less important than the spaces in between them. As in the dry forest, where the single tree is not more important than the whole, five different building types form 11 independent structures disposed in a regular square shape and form the complex. At the ground level, this compact square building 70 by 70 meters is extremely permeable and shaded, inviting students to cross it and to help connect roads and people. In the second level, the circulation defines a square circuit with strong visual connection between the two levels. A system of prefab concrete panels protect the faculty offices from the setting sun. Vertical louvers are very efficient to protect the facade facing north and south in the vertical sun of the equator. The building that hosts the ramps and services constitute the east side of the square where the main entrances are located. This building is not only a threshold to the interior spaces, it also connects ground floor to second floor. Inside the complex, the open air circulations are shaded. The narrow gaps that single buildings leave between them help the light in and favor natural ventilation. The, ambigu the ambiguous outdoor spaces blurs the perception between the whole and the single buildings, as well as in exterior spaces from interior ones. The ambiguity moves to the learning spaces that can be open 
or closed in a more classical configuration. The shaded and ventilated spaces provide places for casual meeting and informal learning among students. In the center, a portion of dry forest cross the building to allow the natural ventilation of the classrooms that are not in the periphery of the square. Louvers and concrete panels were prefab. We built an on-site production plant for these elements. They were easily built in a Peruvian low-cost way. Of course, we couldn't count with a millimetric precision, so when some panels didn't fit in place, we just didn't put them. Again, indetermination allowed us to absorb all true imperfections. But it's not always the case, as in this other and more urban project, a residential building in Lima where we had a more sophisticated technology. Our fourth project is located in between valleys, 2,000 miles south from Lima, in one of the most arid deserts in the world. It was about a side museum of the Paracas ancient civilization, the predecessors of the ones who draw the famous Nazca lines. The original museum was destroyed by a strong earthquake in 2007. The European Union financed its reconstruction and organized an architectural competition. The Paracas Site Museum project was for us an attempt to introduce landscape logics into architecture. We had at the same time a MIGRI budget and a sublime landscape. The first element we defined was an enclosure for the intimacy. Then a horizontal roof as a fifth facade. An element that can protect us from wind and sun. And finally, the inclusion of a series of a low-tech environmental devices that helps divide exhibition spaces. This low-tech environmental device helps us control natural light and ventilation, divide exhibition spaces, and constitute the fifth facade. The elements containing the different programs are related among them by an exterior circulation. We took the same polished ceramic technique for finishing the pre-Columbian vases, rescaled to the size of the building. We used the same pusolanic red cement of the beach houses and decided to polish it as if it was a huge ancient vase. By using these strategies, we were sure that the building would merge in this nearly Martian landscape and at the same time, keep a strong presence in this overwhelming place. As in the place of remembrance, we decided to keep the imperfections of the hand polished so surface. The museum is a map of the adversities this building went through during construction. The series of difficulties ended in an abandoned building for almost four years until it opened to the public on 2015. This porch announces the entrance to the enclosure, acting as a threshold between the vastness of the desert and the confined open space that organize the different programmatic elements. The low tech environmental devices show up in this circulation and one of them constitute the entrance to the museographic space. And in the inside, they help to protect the interiors from the sun. 
and also define spaces for transition in the circuit. But their main intention is to regulate natural light and natural ventilation in a building with a generous height and no air condition. Towards the south, they go for direct sunlight, natural light, bringing it with these suspended white walls. The low-tech environmental devices contains also the main structure. They organize the spatial, spatial sequence in a unique and fluid space. All these projects question us about considering the imperfection as a value in places like ours, where we can still build with affordable pre-industrial techniques, composing with what is there available and waiting to help us making maps. Accepting imperfection, which is the future of the handmade, we cannot continue to explore the dimensions of the craft, the commitment and the good judgment in this intimate connection between mind, hand and matter. And before finishing, I'd like to show you a project that just opened to the public last week, or 10 days ago already, <laughs> which is also part of our patient search. It is the new institutional building for Mokiwa region at the south of Peru. That was the day of the opening. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sandra, for um, this wonderful presentation of yours. You're welcome. <laughs> bringing us a taste of Peru um, from so far away. Mm -hmm. So carefully considered, skillfully constructed, it's obvious that um, you spend a lot of time thinking about your work and time thinking about how you present the work. So thank you for that. You titled your talk From Plans to Maps and three phrases jumped out to me in relation to that particular title. The building is a map of the construction process. The building is a map of human interventions and the building is a map of the adversities of construction. They're all very uh, appropriate to the work itself. Thank you also for those very special videos. Um, as architects, we know and understand that architecture is about experience, about experience of place, about experience of the building, and that it's for people. And while we can't be in Peru tonight, you've brought us a little more than just images and explanation, you've brought us something that helps us get closer to what an experience of those buildings mm -hmm. might be and we appreciate that very much, so thank you for that mm -hmm. as well. There's much for us to discuss, but let us begin with a broader question about context. And perhaps for those that didn't fully appreciate some of the information you imparted, Let's start with Lima. Um, let us know a bit more again about the temperature differences in Lima. So Lima, in Lima we will have the lower temperature uh, will be 14 or 15 degrees and the higher will be 28 or 30. So it's really a, a mild climate. Then uh, we will have um, a cloud installed like uh, eight or nine months in, in the year. 
and through December to April, we will have uh, like a blue sky, but very hazy, yes, hazy, hazy sky. sky. Mm -hmm. And then we won't have any any shower. Any, any there's no rain. So how no much rain, rain at is all? there? Seven millimeter a year. So <laughs> really. So it's important to understand. No, yes, yes. The the temperature range is is quite minimal. Mm. Um, it's not what we might call a tropical landscape. No. There is 90% humidity, so yeah. haze all the year, sometimes some sunshine that comes through that, and this lack of rain. Yes. So it's important to fully appreciate what the conditions are under which these projects are being mm. constructed Concept, and, yeah. and imagined. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Added to that, then, you talked about landscape, and we in Australia, we understand uh, harsh landscapes. We have our own, and many architects deal with mm -hmm. a whole range of different landscapes. But what we see in these images is quite different to what we have. And now, with that information, we can understand that it's even more different. You talked about it even being barren. You know, that's the harsh landscape, barren landscape, but in Lima also you have this whole city of 10 million people mm -hmm. yeah. sitting on that coastline with this cliff edge. So that's extreme as well. Mm -hmm. And then out in your Martian landscape where the museum is, as you described it, maybe tell us a little more about what it is to deal with these kind of conditions. Yes, in all the coast we have um, these little rivers that uh, goes from the glaciers to the ocean, but in between them, it's really desert. So we have it in all the coast. In the, the center, where Lima is, is more mild, and in the north, as in the project of uh, for the university, we have its hottest, uh, uh, more more hot, but we don't have really rain. They have rains only each ten year ten years once with the. A big flood. Yes, yes, a very big flood. And in the south, it's again uh, similar to Lima, maybe a little bit more of sun, more months of sunshine. But mm -hmm. uh, it's in all the, all the coast. And it really changed a lot for us. We started doing these uh, three, three houses while we were working in Paris. And uh, we started being conscious about all this, this uh, mild climate and, and the possibilities we have to do a type of architecture that was ve really very different from the one that we were working on in Paris. So it opens us um, a new space for creation and we, we really felt as paradise working on, on those mm. houses. Mm. Quite a contrast <laughs> to your time in, yes. in France, which we'll get onto in a minute. <laughs> your work appears to succeed, I think, in relating to the traditional architecture of Peru. Um, it has simplicity and complexity. Mm. It is strong and confident and unapologetic about that strength. Yet it is also very sensitive sensitive to place, to people, materials, program, and obviously the realities of construction in Peru. Your work also appears to be an intelligent assimilation of the traditional without pastiche mm. and for your contemporary context. So congratulations on that. But let's start with a question about the, your practice and about the, the traditional the, your relationship to the traditional and what importance that has in the work. Yeah, we we were when we were interested when we came back to Peru in 2006 in visiting those sites that uh, ancient Peruvians had built with so uh, minimum elements and uh, so well done and so. Um, uh, they, they, they were always using strategies to work in the logic of the territory. So in all Peru we have uh, these uh, examples. So 
When we became uh, conscious about this richness, we start visiting all of these um, examples, places, and uh, I think that helps us in our work, in our way of thinking the project. Mm, it became an additional source of knowledge mm -hmm, yes. uh, for what went before, because mm -hmm. perhaps you can explain to the audience a little about the limitations of your education process in Peru, Peru mm. and then your reaction when you left Peru and worked in, in France and then what that meant when you came back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so when we were studying, uh, it was like a difficult period for the country and we as a students, we didn't have access to any magazine or book uh, so we let's really... Let, let's, I'll just stress that's an important point. No <laughs> books, no magazines. And no internet. No internet. <laughs> you only learn what you get in the lecture <laughs> Yes. That's it. So when we had this opportunity to go abroad to France, we really felt as ignorance arriving to, to that continent and decided that we are going to, to catch up and <laughs> visit all the architecture we, we could. And um, so we were in France, so it's the center of Europe, so it was easy to move there and to visit many examples, starting to visit Le Corbusier in France. No? Mm. It was uh, our, our first um, mm, Inspiration. mentor, yes. yes yeah. <laughs> mentor, yes. Inspiration, yes. And um, Jean-Pierre was um, working with Siriani, a Peruvian architect that went to live in France, and he was an important, also an important teacher. And I was I was studying with him, and he really uh, introduced us to to the modern space, to the work of uh, Corbu, and uh, also he um, tell told us that we must go and, and, and draw visiting architecture because it was, it is like the only way of up, um, taking those ideas for us inside and, and keep them in the memories. You had to experience it. Yes. I so experience and draw. Yeah, yeah. And draw. I, think, I think it's apparent in the work that you've, you've learned about experience and by experiencing other things and you've absorbed mm. all this like a sponge perhaps because of the lack of knowledge at university or the lack of information you were given you've wanted to suck up as much knowledge and as much information as possible mm -hmm. and then when you get to your work you get it to play come. and experiment and yes. <laughs> yes let it all come out <laughs> yes this is this is very important and, and then we did that same thing with ancient Peruvian uh, uh, places and mm -hmm. buildings. So we are not doing the same form. We are trying to understand what the ideas were uh, and uh, the strategies. So to use, in order to use them. Mm -hmm. Because many, many architects in Lima, when we arrived in 2006, again to Peru, they were like uh, looking how can we do modern as in America, modern architecture as in America, as in a, as in a um, developed uh, country. Glass buildings. Glass buildings, yes. a lot of glass buildings, white houses and mm. all of that. No? And that's, that's why we, for us, was very important this first project of houses that we do because we decided to take out all the glasses and all the protections and all the elements that were um, unnecessary. Yes, unnecessary mm. because we had this climate and no one is uh, trying to take advantage of that. So all the circulations, staircase be became exteriors and um, that was like a, a big, I think, a big change, also for for the um, for the people there. Mm. It was like very new to have this approach, just accepting what we have. 
ex accepting existing conditions mm -hmm. and designing to take advantage yes. of yes. the adversities. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think some of this was because being in France, you were looking back at your yes, own totally, country through totally, different yes, eyes. Yes. Really, when we went out, we didn't w were really conscious about that. And um, I think really we, we understood many things when we had the opportunity to, to make a project for Lima, the first house. We, uh, we start to, to, make us, to make questions and uh, the second one and the third one uh, was we like, a, yes. Uh, and then that site were for us was a, like a laboratory because then uh, the opportunities presented to to um, continue working there, and each we we were trying to do better in each house. It was difficult because having the same plot, the same size of plot, the same type of program, the same location, we didn't want it to copy, to to build again the same thing. So it also uh, engage us in each time in try to do better and better and be each time more simple and more essential and uh, so it is it, it, it is an imp important project for us yeah absolutely absolutely one of the things you touched upon with such little rain you don't need to deal with the kind of conditions mm. that some of us might need to deal with in terms of waterproofing and sealing the building and all, the, <laughs> all of these things and I'm sure that all the architects here took great note of the lack of balustrades and pool fences <laughs> and various other things. So tell us a little more so people understand about the regulations there compared to perhaps here, but also to France. So you were playing yeah. these two against each mm -hmm. other. It's true that we had less regulations. <laughs> 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 and uh, that's that's why I said we felt in paradise mm. because really we were dealing with so much regulations and not also regulations but um, um, many layers in a building to to protect ourselves from raining from temperatures from many things so it was really a change a, a radical change to make those projects mm. So that leads to uh, talking about methods of construction and uh, you talked about the creation of concrete formwork using old wooden planks, using traditional artisans. Mm -hmm. You have also mentioned to me about the standard form of construction in Peru is pretty basic and the concrete, the way you use it as the whole building, is not common, although concrete is a relatively inexpensive material. So perhaps explain to everyone what is the normal mm -hmm. and then how you've adapted that. So the normal will be to, ha will be to have uh, columns and beams in, uh, in concrete and then uh, infilled walls in bricks. Not very, not very good bricks though. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> then they need some brickworks bricks. Uh, yes. <laughs> we don't have uh, like... Uh, Fancy this type bricks. of yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, this yeah. type of brick face bricks we don't, don't have, have, have yeah, not really. Yeah. So then we covered it with a cement, and then just we paint it because it's we don't have rain. You can use even simple paint paintings, and um, it's true also that um, the labor cost is not that much in in our country so we can do uh, concrete walls with artisanal form work and doesn't cost a lot if you accept this imperfection and irregularities uh, it's not a problem it's not uh, expensive if you want a perfect concrete it's very very expensive mm -hmm. so we were uh, we started to to um, work with concrete, uh, searching for, for um, in order to have uh, all the space defined only by the structure and not have uh, 
in, in not having additional elements um, that will multiply. Uh, yeah, you're trying to eliminate layers yes, and yes. use the structure uh, as uh, the finished. Yes. A product. number of materials, yes. Yes. And obviously, you mentioned Corbusier as an influence, and that of shows course. <laughs> through the work. And each time you're trying to refine what you've learned through the knowledge, but also through your experience yes. about how to use that concrete. Yeah. And I might just point out to everybody that Sandra focused on four main projects and threw in a few little tastes of a few other projects. But I advise all of you to check out the Barclay and Krauss website. They have a beautiful body of work and a lot of projects on that website that you will um, enjoy as much as you have the things you've seen mm -hmm. here tonight. Sandra, you talked about asking the right questions, and I think all good architects understand that. Um, the better architects today also have an interest in finding the opportunities for public spaces in private buildings. It is apparent that this is important in your work. Perhaps you could explain a little more about your situation in Lima and why this is important. Yes, Lima is growing without any, any planification, so we have a lack of public space. That is why in the place of remembrance, we decided to create this big plaza, public plaza, that wasn't in the program, that we, that we think, thought that it was really important to have it. And also the roof is, is a public place. And then each time we have the opportunity in private, uh, for private uh, buildings, we try to, to take out the walls that delimit the public space with the private plot and trying to do spaces, uh, intermediate spaces mm -hmm. that, can, that can connect us to, to the city. To make better connections yes, between public yes, and private. Yes. Part of this privacy relates to security mm -hmm. and the issues that yes, we Peru have, went yes. through, particularly mm -hmm. during that period from yes. 1980 mm -hmm. to 2000. It was a time of political, mm. political violence, as you, as you called it. It was a, a very difficult time of terrorism and lots of killings. And that first project is in memoriam mm. of the 70,000 people that were killed during that time. So in this unstable political climate, perhaps you could explain to us what it is like, what, what was it like for people to be an architect because you weren't there for the whole time? And then what's it like for you now, having come out of that political mm -hmm. climate? Those years, in those years, architecture has no place at all. So no architecture. No architecture at all. Mm. It was a, different, uh, a difficult period, but um, one of the things that happened is that uh, President abolished, in those years, abolished uh, the public architectural competitions. And because there were no architecture going on, it was like no, in, no one. No uh, one had work. <laughs> yes. yes. And then now the, the, the country after 2000 start to go in better and started to do uh, public buildings. Uh, they, we are, as architects, we, we have no not the opportunity to 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 participate in a competition because the competition is only for builders and quality is not a, a line in the it's so so this competition is really just a tendering process it's yes a number it's a number construction companies competing yes. for a price mm -hmm. yeah, only. it's not about the quality yes. of the architecture so we uh, 60 of, uh, of practices in Lima uh, put us together uh, in, an, in an association and we are trying to change that law, but it's difficult. Mm. In, once mm. it's installed, it's difficult to change things. So in those three projects that are now public, so the Museum Paracas, the Place of Remembrance, and the last one that we just opened, the office building for the region, they started as private initiative and that's why they were competitions, a process of competitions, because the money was 
not came not from the from the state but from public not, not from the Peruvian yeah. people no. or the government yes. but private yes yeah. so in pl in the place of remembrance they went to ask for money and the European Union gave us um, gave the money to the commission of true so and they also found the site um, then for the Mission Paracas, it, it was again the uh, European Union that pays for the, <laughs> pays for the reconstruction of mm -hmm. the museum. And uh, in the last one, uh, it, it, there are three private companies that, uh, that paid the building with their taxes. And then now uh, the, the building will be public but it all, it's all organized by private companies. Mm, so mm. it's the only way we had to, to have competitions yeah. by private projects. Well, I must say congratulations in a country with very few competitions to have won three with three excellent buildings. That's, you're doing very well. <laughs> and in a country like Australia where we don't really, still don't really have a culture of comp architectural competitions, we might actually be a bit horrified to find that there was a country that had yes. a very <laughs> healthy competition pop system yes. and it's been abolished by the president. So mm -hmm. we hope that things yeah. improve mm -hmm. in the future. Okay, so let's move on to your practice and the actual working mm -hmm. of the practice. Tell the audience a little about how many people you have to create this work, what kind, what ages they are, where are they from, what countries and the issue of having people working in Peru. Mm -hmm. We are a little team. We are between four and eight, maximum eight, and both mm. of us, Jean-Pierre and me. And we, we have al always, we, we need to have in mind that we have to adapt to the economy, this fragile economy of the country. So that's why I'm telling between four and eight because it fluctuates. <laughs> yes. Yeah, depending on projects. Yes, and, yeah. and they are young. Our team is young, and many times they stayed some years and they go away to study out abroad. It's it's very common mm -hmm. there in the country. Uh, we have always a French person to do the to maintain a connection with France. And uh, we have al always one or two students that are practicing in the, in the mm, office. Mm. So for any of you having to make an argument to potential clients that you need a big office to create really good work, here's a great example of how to manage that process through four to eight people. Um, and I know some people here do that as well, but it's often expected that mm. larger projects are f only from larger offices. Jean-Pierre is your business partner. And husband. And husband, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and we have a few similar couples in Australia. Let us know your working relationship. How mm. do you and he work? How do you and he um, continue in private time? Mm -hmm. how, how do you combine <laughs> and come together with these ideas? So we, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true that there is no limits between uh, private time and uh, working time. hours. Yeah. So <laughs> that's a problem, I think, that uh, doesn't, never stops, works never stops. But also um, we found like a dynamic where when we, felt in peace so in weekends <laughs> and traveling we are uh, that that's that's are the moment when we are more creating and more doing projects um, and then in the weekdays is very busy so uh, so we are always arriving Mondays with many many drawings and uh, and instructions for the team mm. but uh, it's like that dynamic and uh, we we always start by when we have a project by talking a lot about ideas 
and uh, about uh, how we want to organize the space and um, even try to imagine the space uh, and the building itself before uh, taking a pencil or drawing uh, plans. And then once we agreed in the idea, in the abs in the, uh, just by talking, we start drawing and making models and then we can uh, ask the team uh, to uh, continue working on them, but we are always present in all the process. And we like a lot to go to the site when it's uh, in the construction process also. Mm. It sounds like you have a very strong relationship, a very special relationship where you are constantly engaging with each other in this mm. dialogue and inspiring each other through this dialogue to create the ideas yeah, first it. and mm -hmm. then the work. Yes. <laughs> yes. So in that slide where you showed the process being sketch leading to model, leading to drawings, yes. leading to building, yeah. there is an important first step that you left out, which is the dialogue. Mm -hmm. and yes. <laughs> until you both agree on the idea mm -hmm. through that dialogue, you don't move forward to one single mm -hmm. drawing. Mm -hmm. yeah. As that, we found that we felt that we both are um, together, we are doing the project and not one of us or the one who draw or the one who did the model. And so we are l looking to work for the project, not for one of us. Mm. So for you, it's important. The project is the most important. Yes. It's not about who came up mm -hmm. with any part mm -hmm. of it. No, no. Yeah. And it's a project is never one idea, it's many ideas, it's mm. complex work, and there are many things to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before I, I wrap up, I, as I mentioned afterwards, you're welcome to come and talk to Sandra, ask her your own questions, and um, engage before mm -hmm. we wander off to some dinner a little later on. We have plenty of time for that. I perhaps if there is there any burning question that the whole group needs to hear one up the back let me know and I'll translate it here yeah just the work is absolutely inspiring no planting So do you have landscaping? Uh, <laughs> so because we are in a desert, we really um, use little, little yeah. planting. Water and is precious. Yes, water is precious. And for example, in, in, in the Paracas Museum, that's a national park protecting the life of lots of animals that are there. And also it's an archeological site. We can't touch Nothing it's, it's outside. A, it's a park, but not yes. as we know it. No, no. <laughs> it's a, it's a it's reserva. I yeah, don't know yeah. how... T no, no, that's, that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. But yeah. I think the translation in English yes. is National Park, but it, yes, ha it is. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. When um, leave. And so um, we are always trying to explain uh, to, to Lim people in Lima, our clients, that we live in a desert. So because they are obsessed in having grass. Grass is like uh, the top. <laughs> <laughs> so we, it's, it, I think we as architects have to educate our clients. Mm. And uh, in that sense, we are using the minimum elements. And we have some trees that grows with very little uh, water and that are from that, the place, no? Uh, and mm. with so, so we try to use those type of of trees for, for example when we have a, a project to do would you like to tell your tree story for uh. your ha <laughs> while we were here um, Sandra got an email or a phone call <laughs> a phone call a phone call that in that uh, holiday house one of which is hers the tree, the very important tree, the only tree in the <laughs> courtyard. <laughs> Apparently is dead. <laughs> is dead. It was very sad. <laughs>
because it takes to so much effort to mm. to nurture but it it, it, it was a mejo me, a mejo that it it is it's from, from that place yes, yes so and even that found it difficult to continue yeah something yeah. happened something <laughs> we i can't understand being here yeah, yeah. <laughs> I so must go, go and see. You'll I must go back go and, and fix, yes. fix this. <laughs> yes. Okay, so Sandra, you came here from Lima. Four flights, Lima to Santiago, to Auckland, to Sydney, to Perth. And then from Perth, we've been, uh, for Brickworks, we've been to Perth, Brisbane, Sydney, Hobart, Adelaide, and now Melbourne. We can complete our travels <laughs> and our journey and our lecture series here in Melbourne. Can you please help me in thanking Sandra Barclay for this wonderful oh, you're presentation? Welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Before you get up, we have the prize to draw. We have this wonderful uh, publication and a wonderful uh, show bag from Brickworks that includes champagne. <laughs> Please look underneath your seat. If you have a Brickworks card, you are the winner. <laughs> Hoping it's not one of the empty chairs. <laughs> have we got anyone? Yes. Have a look. I don't know. Have a look. Have a look under chairs. the extra ones. <laughs> there must be one. Stephanie, you know where it is. Have we got it? Hang on, we're, we're getting there, we're getting there. Uh, oh, there he is. Okay, come and get your prize. Oh. <laughs> So everybody, thank you for coming this evening. This is probably the biggest audience we've had in Melbourne. We'll be back again next year, uh, bigger and better, um, and maybe even, well, I won't talk about that, but we will have <laughs> more talks, um, both the Double Talks and the International Series continuing next year. On behalf of Brickworks, I wish you all a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Please come and talk to Sandra. Please enjoy the food and drink that's still available and chat amongst yourselves. Thank you very much. Good night.